So hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon. We're going to start our uh, second uh, talk about Future City Seminar Series. Uh, we are very delighted to have Professor Yafeng Yin from University of Michigan uh, with us. Uh, he has been a distinguished uh, researcher and he, uh, let me introduce you with Professor Yafeng Yin. Dr. Yafeng Yin is a professor of civil and environmental engineering, a professor of industrial and operations engineering at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. He works in the area of transportation systems analysis and modeling and has published more than 130 referred papers in leading academic journals. His current research focuses on connected and automated mobility systems. He currently serves as area editor of transportation science, associate editor of transportation research part B, and he was editor in chief of transportation research part C between 2014 and 2020. Uh, Dr. Yin received his PhD from University of Tokyo, Japan in 2002, his master's and bachelor's degrees from Tsinghua University, Beijing, China in 1996 and 1994. Prior to his current appointment at the University of Michigan, he was a faculty member at the University of Florida between 2005 and 2016, which is very close to us. Um, we're very glad to have Professor Yafing in and uh, without further ado, the, I'll, I'll let Professor Yafing in speak uh, about his great talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samuel, um, for the uh, introduction and then um, for the invitation as well. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk today. Um, so it's my uh, great pleasure um, to speak at this Future City Seminar Series. Um, so as Samuel mentioned, um, um, I think I was supposed to come to do an in-person seminar, um, I think in before pandemic. Um, so my trip was canceled um, due to the pandemic. Um, so now we decided to do this virtual seminar. Um, so the virtual seminar seems to become a new norm. Um, however, I personally um, still like the in-person seminar better because I always enjoy the interaction with the audience uh, during the seminar and off the seminar, the, the, the in-person seminar. Um, so therefore, um, let's try to make the, my talk even virtual uh, to be more interactive. Um, so therefore, if you have any question um, and for clarification, for example, please feel free to in interrupt me. Um, or you can type your question in the chat window. Um, actually, I, I monitor the chat window when I speak. Um, and if, if you can, I, I encourage you to also turn on your camera. Uh, this way I can speak to you uh, better than speaking to myself. Um, so I can see your faces, that, that creates some, some environment for me, um, like an in-person seminar. Um, thank you very much. Um, so um, my talk today uh, is about uh, navigating through the dark ages of automated vehicle deployment. Um, so in this talk, um, I will stay at a very high level. Um, I will not get into details of specific research. And also not all the research I'm going to mention um, is my research. Um, instead, um, I actually plan to share with you uh, some of my recent thoughts on the challenges of the um, we will face uh, in the deployment of automated vehicles um, and discuss how our community, the transportation community, uh, can do research to help overcome those challenges. Um, so, I hope my talk will be useful, um, particularly to, uh, for example, postdocs and PhD students um, who are looking for research topics. Um, so for the um, lack of the um, better words, um, I use um, Doc H um, to refer to the initial stage of the AV deployment uh, when, when AV actually compromise the system efficiency and safety. Um, so I will focus more on efficiency in this talk. Um, so this curve, um, essentially, I tried to make the, make the point that um, how the system efficiency conceptually uh, change with the market penetration of AV. So with um, early um, deployment of, of, um, um, of AVs, um, due to the liability concerns, um, the OEMs, car makers will likely uh, conservatively configure the AVs uh, with low operation speed, longer headway. Um, so those AV will behave as a moving bottlenecks um, in traffic stream, slowing down other traffic um, and, and increasing congestions. 
And also the benefit promised by AV can also be offset by the increase in vehicle mile travel generated by empty trips uh, of AVs and also induced travel demand. So I suspect that um, such a efficiency uh, degradation uh, could last quite some time before the, uh, until the AV technology is mature enough or the market penetration is high enough, uh, reach a certain threshold. Because a lot of, as you know, a lot of the benefit promised by AV hinge upon AV market penetration being sufficiently high. Um, so the question here becomes, uh, what can we do uh, to navigate through this dark age? Um, so a powerful policy, if you think about it, uh, to address the negative impacts I just mentioned, uh, low speed, longer headway, um, and empty trips, um, uh, et cetera, and induced demand, um, you can actually price the utilization of AV uh, in a way to internalize the externalities, right? So, but the timing of the implementation of this type of pricing policy is critical because the congestion pricing or the Pigovian tax will actually increase the cost of using AV, so thereby discouraging the early adoptions. So it appears that um, we need to endure the short pain for long-term benefit, which means that we may have to subsidize um, those early adopters to encourage AV adoptions uh, to reduce the duration um, of this uh, dark age. Even though those early adopters actually compromise the system efficiency uh, for the sake of their own benefits, uh, we still want to subsidize them. So the subsidy policy intend to reduce the duration of the dark age. Another thing we can do um, will be try to raise up this curve um, by doing, I call innovative uh, participatory traffic control. Um, so you want to utilize the AV as a control actuators uh, to better and more proactively tra manage traffic to improve system efficiency. Um, so another thing we can do is uh, infrastructure adaptation, which can both raise up this curve or even encourage the adoption of AV to reduce the duration of the dark age. But lastly, uh, perhaps uh, more importantly, is we need to determine the standard for AV adoptions um, because this standard actually influenced um, the starting point and the shape of the curve because this is the standard that the car maker has to meet before they can sell the vehicle uh, to the market. So after all, if you require the AV technology to be perfect, before they can enter the market, we may not necessarily experience such an initial drop. So that's reason why the standard for adoption uh, is very critical. So in the following, I would like to uh, briefly discuss on those four policies one by one. Um, I will start with standard for application adoptions followed by subsidy and then discuss the participatory traffic control and then complete by discussing the infrastructure adaptations. Okay, so let's look at standards for adoptions. Um, I think the key question here uh, we intend to answer is how to measure um, and um, the uh, safety and driving proficiency and, and what are the threshold. Um, so um, a standard goes hand in hand uh, with a testing framework because we need to know whether the AV meets the standard or not, right? So for testing, if you want to establish a testing framework, we need to answer two questions. What type of test do AV have to take and what constitutes a passing grade? Um, so, um, and certainly we want to test safety testing and also driving proficiency test. Uh, I'm talking about two types of tests. Um, and at this moment, I'm not aware any prior work on the driving proficiency test because this is a more relevant to the efficiency problem I just uh, mentioned. Um, but on the other hand, um, quite a few uh, people, quite a few groups are working on um, the uh, safety test um, and because it's more important. Um, so let's look at safety tests um, and, and um, let's look at safety standards. Um, uh, this is a actually active research uh, areas. Um, however, I think both questions remain unanswered. The question is what type of tests we need to take and what constitute a passing grade. So, um, and because the on-road testing is not practical because um, it's required too many miles driven uh, to prove whether an AV is safer uh, than a human driver's. And simulation doesn't work due to the, uh, the low fidelity and testing track uh, cannot provide meaningful interaction between AV and background traffic. 
So the current state of art is a combination of those three. Um, so here I listed a couple of works uh, done my colleague at Michigan. Uh, the first work is really from uh, Hui Pong's group. Uh, Professor Hui Pong is, uh, um, is from mechanical engineering. Uh, the second recent work is from uh, my colleague, Professor Henry Liu. Um, and um, so um, as I understand it, because I don't work in this, on this problem, um, the key of their research is to create a simulated driving environment that is statistically consistent with the naturalistic driving environment. And then they use important sampling to make rare events or the corner cases to occur more frequently to test AV while ensuring the unbiased estimate of the safety uh, performance. So that's the essence of their research. So the second question is um, essentially is how safe is safe in that? Is this is also very interesting. Um, so if you use human driver as a benchmark, uh, the fatality rate of fatality rate of human driver is one death per 90 million miles. Um, and so then uh, the passing grade could be, for example, 10 times safer than human driver, 100 times safer than human drivers. So such a, uh, a um, threshold has a huge implication because it's determining the timing to allow AV to be available on the market. Um, so as this paper pointed out, um, and the perfect will be the enemy of good, because a lower standard, it would probably too late uh, if we wait um, for the AV technology to be perfect. Um, so a lower standard could allow AV to enter the market earlier, uh, saving lives in short term and generating more knowledge to further improve the AV safety. Um, however, under such a policy, um, AV could still cause many crashes, injury, fatality, although there are much fewer than their human counterparts, but a severe accident can cause a serious setback in the AV diffusion process. So there's a trade-off that has, be, has to be done. So I believe the research on the standard for adoption um, is very important. Um, and I feel that it's largely overlooked by our community. Uh, this actually is not just a vehicle technology problem, it's actually a transportation problem. Um, and we don't have to work on the vehicle technology side to do research in these areas. Um, for example, for those who like doing modeling, um, there's many interesting problems. Uh, for example, um, it would be feasible to propose a, um, a, a, a dynamic programming framework uh, to answer the question of what's the optimal timing to introduce AV to the market. You want to op optimize that uh, safety standards. Um, so I can, I can see there's some uh, potential uh, research uh, to be done in this, on this particular topic. Okay, so now let's look at the second um, uh, policy, which is uh, the subsidy policy. Um, and the purpose here is to try to accelerate the adoption of AV to reduce the duration of the dark age. Um, so the design of the subsidy policy, uh, subsidy policy to answer the following question, uh, how much to subsidize and whom to subsidize and when to initiate and when to phase out. If it's very useful, you can use uh, the EV subsidy as a reference, for example, um, and who to subsidize. And you can, you can notice that um, in the US, uh, customers are directly subsidized, but in China, um, the car makers are directly subsidized. The customers do not receive subsidy from the government. Okay, so there are pros and cons for each approach. And also when to subsidize, the design can be um, either to specify a timeline or set up a quota, uh, a quota on the number of budget. And once the quota is used up and then the subsidy policy will end, uh, it will be interesting to explore different design of the AV policy, uh, subsidy policy. So now I'd like to share with you um, a, a paper we published uh, two years ago. Um, and so in this paper, we try to investigate a subsidy policy to accelerate the diffusion of the AV uh, to maximize the total expected benefit over a planning horizon. Um, so we formed the problem as a Stackerberger game, a leader follows game, uh, because the, lead, the government is the leader, the car maker will be the follower. Um, government decide the subsidy, subsidy policy and the car maker decide uh, the, their best response to uh, innovate the, the AV to change the diffusion process of the AV to maximize their, their, their profit or expected utility. 
Um, so, however, the government cannot observe the, their, their efforts of uh, innovating AV. The government can only observe the AV's uh, market penetration when deciding uh, the subsidy policy. So therefore the design of the policy essentially is a principal agent problem. Um, so therefore this, this Stackelberger game is very challenging because it's just dynamic. We're doing this type of time dependent modeling framework. It's uncertain because the diffusion process is, is stochastic. Uh, with asymmetric informations. So I will not spend time um, on explaining how we handle the challenges. Um, I just want to highlight, uh, briefly highlight our research finding. So the optimum policy we get um, has two threshold structure. So there's an early subsidy, there's a later subsidy, there's no subsidy in between. The early subsidy, essentially, um, you want to um, generate, create early demand, um, the subsidy actually decrease with the increase of the market penetrations. And then you do not have any subsidy in between. And then the late subsidy uh, is implemented when the AV market penetration is high and incentivizing uh, the OEM to continue to produce AV. And then the subsidy actually increase with the increase of the market penetrations. So that's the research finding uh, we generate. That's a, an insight we generate from this study. Um, so. Uh, compared with the abundant literatures on EV subsidies, um, I think the research on EV subsidy is very, very limited. Since we published that paper, um, there's a couple of follow-up studies um, has been published, but the research is still very limited. Uh, I think um, the most important research question is still that whether we really need a, a EV subsidy um, and when and under what condition we need it. And if a subsidy, uh, subsidy is indeed beneficial um, to investigate the optimal design of the subsidy policy by considering a better diffusion process that capture the impacts of the subsidies on innovation, trust in AV technology, uh, and also considering the competition between AV and regular vehicles among multiple generations of AV technology and also among quite a few uh, AV um, manufacturers. I think also it's also very critical uh, to do empirical study um, and to, um, to examine the effectiveness of AV subsidy and also their distributional effects. Um, so that's, that's what I have to say about um, the um, um, AV subsidy policy. Um, and then let's look at the third policy. Um, so because AV actually provide a new instrument uh, for us to control traffic. So um, participatory traffic control is to leverage AV in the traffic stream to better manage our traffic system to raise up um, or change the shape of this benefit curve. Um, I think many of you are familiar with the work done uh, by uh, Professor Bayan from, from UC Berkeley, then work on Wendell um, and, and also Kathy Wu from MIT. And also my colleague, uh, Gabor Orozi, um, also work in these areas. So their work demonstrates the potential of using AV as a mobile actuator to regular traffic streams, right? For a simple ring, this is an experiment done by Dan, Dan work. Uh, for a simple ring, controlling one AV uh, will be sufficient. Uh, with a regular geometry, it is possible to just smooth the traffic stream by controlling less than 5% of traffic, right? So this is what I call an AV as a traffic stream regulator, um, because by the mechanism is to leverage the car following behaviors, right? So uh, by controlling the AV speed, we can influence vehicle following that AV. Um, and so this is, um, um, then you utilize that car following behavior, you can regulate traffic. Um, so I call this traffic stream regulator. but. If you go beyond this concept, um, the AV can also serve as a traffic demand distributor, okay? Um, so the working hypothesis is that by changing the departure turn or rule choices of small number AV, you can influence a larger number of uncontrolled vehicles travel decision to improve the overall performance, right? So the prior studies suggest that by controlling, for example, 20% traffic, it can make a meaningful difference. So in our research, we look at um, if you, what, what happens if you want to replicate system optimum, how much traffic you, need, you can control. 
we compute this minimum control ratio. Uh, this is minimum minimum percentage of the traffic need to be controlled in order to achieve system optimum. So therefore, if you if you can control twenty percent of vehicle uh, in many of the in some of the network, you can actually replicate system optimum. Okay, um, but I think more importantly, uh, we show that if you integrate uh, AV control with another control instrument, for example, pricing, um, you can achieve very remarkable, uh, remarkable synergistic effect. Okay, so for example, in this study, uh, we demonstrate that if you integrate AV path control with path based pricing, you only need to control less than 1% of traffic without collecting any toll revenue at all to achieve system optimum. So we are very, we were very surprised by this, this, this result. Okay, so there's a huge potential here. Um, so in, in, in terms of the research opportunity that come to my mind in these areas, um, I think for, for the AV as a traffic stream regulator, um, I don't work on this, in, on this topic, but with my limited reading of the topic of the research, uh, I feel that one thing that um, in the current control um, no matter it is model-based or reinforcement learning based, uh, it is commonly assumed that AV had a full picture of the traffic state. So there's certainly an information gap that needs to be addressed in order for the control to be practical. So for training or implementation, AV need the information downstream to respond to the traffic perturbation efficiently and information upstream that provide the feedback of its impact on the, on the traffic flow. So the information stay and, and its availability in the training or information uh, implementation must be explicitly considered in the research. And, and it's also certainly interesting to investigate um, the control of multiple AV to control the traffic stream. So that's the idea I have um, in terms of AV as a traffic stream regulator. Um, AV as a traffic demand distributor, um, I, the research I show here, these three research really, I believe the low hanging fruit, okay? Um, and meaningful research directions should examine, examine the control in a dynamic and distributed setting. Uh, the control can be model-based or reinforcement learning based. For reinforcement learning based, it will be interesting to investigate the multi-aging reinforced learning to learn the policy that only rely on partial observation or localized information for implementation while achieving certain level of optimality. On the other hand, I think new field control will be promising for developing uh, a model-based control. And also, um, I think as I mentioned, AV um, as a control instrument uh, should be integrated with other regular controller like red metering, uh, variable, variable spin limit of, and pricing. Um, and I think you will be surprised as we were um, by the remarkable synergistic effect this, of these integrations. So last but not the least, um, from the behavioral perspective, um, not every AV wants to be controlled. Um, some incentive can be, need to be provided to incentivize AV to serve as a controller, control actuator. So I can imagine a scenario where uh, depending on the position of the AV in the queue, um, the system can compute the willingness to, willingness to pay uh, based on the benefit of controlling that particular AV, and then use a auctioning mechanism to select AV to be incentivized to be controlled. So I think some of the interesting mechanical design problem will arise in that domain. Okay. Um, so overall, I feel I feel that this is the area that would fascinate fascinate many uh, in the transportation communities. Uh, perhaps you have been working on this topic, um, um, and I hope my discussion is useful. Um, so now, lastly, um, so let's look at um, the um, infrastructure adaptation, um, which is to modify our transition infrastructure system to adapt to, more importantly, to support and promote the deployment of AVs, okay? So we can start from simple things like making um, the, the um, um, mark. Uh, make the uh, making signage or marking to be more recognizable by AVs, designing drop-off pickup um, location to facilitate the far first mile or last mile of your AV ride. Um, in longer run, um, I think we need to change the way we design facility, for example, intersections, because they're currently designed um, for the manually driven vehicles, 
uh, we could design them to be, for example, uh, more user friendly uh, for AV to facilitate the man maneuver and, and increase throughput. Um, so uh, intersection control, uh, intersection design and control, I think is a, a fascinating topic, a topic that exists probably almost a century, right? So in the past 100 years, our profession has perfect the design and control of an intersection uh, for manually driven vehicles. Uh, but the AV technology uh, provide new opportunity to transform the way we design and control the intersections. So in addition to the provision of the real-time vehicle location information, uh, I think this AV technology enable two things. The first one is uh, the technology will substantially decrease the required buffer, um, the headway between two moving vehicles, either following a crossing. Um, you just need to, you, you can reduce that buffer uh, substantially. But more importantly, I think in a fully AV environment, the design of the intersection or the right-of-way allocation principle can be much more complicated, which would otherwise confuse a human drivers, okay? So we recently worked on um, this, this uh, topic. And so our research actually uh, generate uh, has been, uh, we actually have some very interesting and promising results uh, that has been documented in these three papers. Um, but in the interest of time, I will not spend time um, introducing this, this paper, but I'd like to share uh, two insights uh, from our series of research. Uh, the first insight is um, the recipe, essentially the, what we learned from this research, right? So the re recipe of optimum right-of-way allocation even in the fully automated vehicle environment, is still grouping and taking turn. You group multiple vehicle, different stream together, and then into a group, and then you allocate the right away one group at a time. So this is like, like the way currently we organize the traffic signal control. But the way you do the grouping and taking turn will be different from the traditional traffic signal control. As such, um, the traffic light which is a simple control device, will now be able to accommodate the new way of grouping and taking turn. In other words, you have a new way of grouping and, and taking turn and the, the, the traffic light can now be used to implement the new way of taking turn and grouping. Um, so we have to go with signal free or use more advanced control devices. Um, that's the first thing I learned. The second thing I learned is the intersection geometry design should serve the right way allocation principle. Um, so the current design we have like from Green Book, uh, which is the outcome of the engineering practice for over a century. So they're actually near optimum for traffic signal control. But if you try to use a signal free operation, if you have a new principle of right way allocation, the intersection layout need to be changed and re-optimized, okay? So that's the two insights um, and two things we learned from doing this research. Um, so given the interest of time, that's what I plan to, to say about intersection design and control. I'm not so sure whether my, the insight I share uh, resonated with you or not, but if you're interested, I can speak more about this later in the Q&A sessions, okay? So, um, I think in addition to the intersection layout and control, um, we can designate, designate certain length to be um, AV length. Um, and for one thing, the AV length will have much higher throughput uh, than regular length, but more importantly, it would encourage the adoption of AV and similar to what high occupancy vehicle length intended it, right? So when we have so many AV length, we can make um, some of the uh, area to be AV zones. Um, so the certain area of the traffic network will be AV only, so where innovative control can be implemented um, to improve system efficiency. So the research question associated with AV lane and AV zone will be naturally when and where to place them, right? So we have done some of the early work uh, on this topic. Um, and so I certainly believe that the future um, traffic network uh, in the uh, automated um, uh, area era 
will look much different from the from what we have today. Um, so many interesting questions actually arise in the design of the future traffic network and in the determination of roadmap that evolved the network from the present to the future. Um, so that's what we call physical um, infrastructure adaptation planning. Um, but my focus today is not just on this physical adaptation. I would like to spend more time um, on the uh, on an, another type of adaptation, which is uh, digitalization of infrastructures. Okay, so um, um, it's essentially you want to digitalize the infrastructure to promote uh, to provide support uh, for automated driving. So loosely speaking, I think driver um, performs three tasks when driving: uh, perception, planning, and control. So the current vehicle-centric approach for driving. Um, is to put sensors and the intelligence on the vehicle side, right? Um, and to perform all those three tasks. Um, so this is not necessarily the best approach. Um, the sensing capability of the individual vehicle is still limited, even with high-end sensors, leading to accidents and or fatality that you must have heard of. Um, so, um, So one may naturally, I think it's, it also doesn't not make economical sense um, because you put all the sensors on each of the vehicle. So if the vehicle is privately owned and parked most of the time, uh, it doesn't make economical sense. So one may naturally wonder uh, why not off some of the sensor from the vehicle and put them into the infrastructure, right? So this is a certainly feasible. I think some of you are um, may recall the demo uh, made by California Path 25 years ago on Interstate 15. So this is a proof of concept for automated highway system, which is more of a infrastructure centric approach. Uh, you put sensor on the infrastructure. In this case, the magnetic sensor was installed along the freeway to guide the vehicles. So this is a more of a infrastructure centric approach. So here, what I'm talking about is some, somewhere in between. I talk about the vehicle uh, infrastructure cooperation for enabling driving automations. So in this concept, the roadside units or sensor are deployed um, um, at the infrastructure site to support uh, automated driving. Um, so the roadside unit to be deployed uh, will not be the typical roadside unit you observe nowadays. Um, for the connect, connected vehicle application, right? So it should consist of um, LIDAR, radar, camera, edge computing devices, and such a smart sensor node will be able to provide support for automated driving, achieving corporate sensing, corporate planning, and corporate driving. Um, so this video was created by Ford, and so they're trying to illustrate um, a, a scenario of cooperative sensing. Um, so a vehicle uh, cross this intersection. So there's a there's a um, a, a object uh, blocking the view of this AV, and then the roadside unit actually can help the AV to better sense the environment. Um, so uh, Ford actually is doing field operation study um, of this type of smart sensor node uh, in some of the city, including Miami. Okay. Um, so from a societal perspective, um, so here's, a, here's a something I want to mention. Um, so from a societal perspective, if we want to allocate our investment between infrastructure or vehicle to enabling driving automation, so to have an optimal investment, the marginal return of the investment on each site uh, has to be equal, right? Um, so in this sense, in the first best setting, vehicle infrastructure, infrastructure cooperation will naturally arise. And also due to the heterogeneity in the utilization of vehicle and infrastructure, there will be various level of digitalization and automations. We also look at the interaction between the automaker of the digital service providers. Um, and those are the providers that install the roadside units along the freeway or along the, uh, in, on the infrastructures. So the strategic interaction between automaker and digital service provider will result in suboptimal investment in vehicle automation and infrastructure digitalization. This is essentially 
uh, what is happening now, um, when these tech two technology are complementary to each other, the service provider will be reluctant to invest uh, in digital infrastructure and vehicle, the OEM uh, tend to over equip the vehicle um, so as to avoid relying on infrastructure technology. So this is what is happening today. And as compared with the first best pricing, uh, first best setting. So in the first best setting, um, uh, we, we want this two operator to player work together. Um, and so, um, and, and that's really why the vehicle infrastructure cooperation will naturally arise. Um, and certainly because the way we use vehicle um, and vehicle, different type of vehicle will be utilized differently. And also the infrastructure, that's some of the infrastructure are congested, some are not. That's really why you will have different level of digitalization and automation. So for automation, I think many of you are familiar with the SAE uh, six level of vehicle automation, right? Which has been uh, recently updated. So similarly, depending on how much support um, the infrastructure can provide for automated driving, um, you can actually classify the infrastructure to also into different levels. Um, so this is the exercise done by European Road Transport Research Advisory Council. Um, so they propose five level of the um, uh, classification with level A being uh, cooperative driving, level B being cooperative uh, perceptions. Um, another proposal uh, in China uh, classify the uh, infrastructure into I0 to I5 in corresponding to the automation level at, on the vehicle side from L0 to L5. Um, so, so then, um, this type of classification, the combination will lead to different level of cooperation, uh, or cooperative driving automations. Um, and so in a way, in this concept, um, I think in a way you can think about infrastructure become, can fully or partially perform some of the driving task and become an integral component of the automated driving systems. Okay, so that's fully, is a sort of um, like um, part of the driving systems. Um, um, so I think personally, I believe that infrastructure assisted automated driving is technically feasible and economically sensible, but certainly it's gonna require um, a coordination between OEMs and also infrastructure operators. And it's a very critical um, um, to form a policy to incentivize these two sectors to collaborate. Um, it will be costly to digitalize existing infrastructure. Um, it's unclear who's going to pay for this cost. Uh, could be OEMs, uh, could be um, DOT road operators, could be a third party like an insurance company, and even a private entity like Cavenue. I'm not so sure whether you are familiar with this company or not. Uh, so they actually try to propose to equip a digitalized uh, infrastructure to support automated driving. Um, and I think it's, it's very important to identify business uh, opportunity and use cases and develop innovative financing model to scale up the deployment. Um, and and um, I also believe that interesting research question arise when you try to decide whether to locate uh, this type of roadside units, the smart sensor nodes to facilitate the vehicle infrastructure cooperation. Um, and as we demonstrated uh, in this recent paper on locating RSU, to overcome the connectivity gap. Um, I think the location problem is gonna vary depending on your purpose, which could be cooperative perception, cooperative planning and cooperative control. Um, I'm not aware of any prior work on those location problems. Um, and also I believe that a lot of potential issues question when you try to involve infrastructure in cooperative driving automations, um, because many of you uh, may have been working on cooperative driving automations, uh, and most of them um, focus on vehicle to vehicle cooperation. So if you threw the infrastructure into the mix, very likely you will have a new problem, okay? Um, so this is uh, mostly I plan to discuss. Um, and although my talk so far um, was centered on efficiency, um, I believe the same thing will happen for safety. Um, so this is the figure created by a SEMU professor predicting what is going on, what's going to happen on the AV safety performance during the testing period. Okay, he talked about testing period. So it's easy to see that um, the, the, improvement, the improvement of the 
um, automation safety capability uh, will be offset by the um, by the reduced supervision effort from the onboard operator and yielding this type of concave curve, uh, con convex curve, um, so that the initial drop in the overall safety performance. Um, so this is what this is for the well, testing. Um, I suspect a drop on the safety performance could also observe after AV entered the market um, and entered the, the, the trending systems. Um, so one possible reason will be the aggressive driving behavior of human drivers. Um, and which is, if, because you know that the AV are programmed to stay safe and will likely accommodate your aggressive driving behaviors. And then you tend to drive aggressively. So I can tell you my personal experience. Um, I, I think such a bully behavior, as this paper pointed out, um, um, is probably real. Um, so I often um, come across an automated vehicle when I drive on campus in Ann Arbor. And sometimes I, I, I'm tempted to make some aggressive um, maneuver um, because I'm curious how to see how those AV will react. Um, so I think this, um, um, I believe the bully behavior is going to be um, um, not prevailing, but definitely not a rare event. Um, so that's going to compromise safety. Okay. So there's some recent work pro proposing solution to such a bully behavior, which I found interesting. I would like to just share with you. So one solution, uh, one solution is um, is from the legal framework. They try to design a liability rule to allocate the direct cost associated with um, accident between driver and, and AV. Um, and, and, and then, so they try to design the optimum liability um, to, to, to solve these issues. Um, the other one is even interesting. Uh, the other one is perhaps you can add uncertainty uh, to the response of AV. Uh, if the AV become more unpredictable, like human drivers, and then the human driver will be, will be uh, less likely to bully AVs because you don't know how AV is going to react. Okay, so there's an interesting trade off you have to make, right? If you add too much uncertainty, then um, you're going to jeopardize the whole systems. Um, so, definitely the, the optimal level of uncertainty here, uh, which I found interesting. Um, so, this is definitely another interesting question to look at. Okay, so this is what I prepared to talk about today. Um, I think the take home message for, from me um, are that there will be a long period of time before we fully transition, transition into a fully automated mobility systems. Um, I believe AV will compromise safety and system efficiency at the initial stage of their deployment. Um, and the imperfect AV technology is not the only reason for the, uh, for the uh, degradations and human behaviors and other factors are, are to blame. Um, so um, the, general, the public agency can change law, policy, and practice to promote and facilitate the deployment of, and, and of the AV technologies. Um, and I feel that um, a lot of research opportunity will arise in this quest. Okay, so with this, I uh, conclude my, uh, my talk. Uh, I'll be happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you, Professor Yafimin, Professor Yi. Uh, it was a very fascinating talk. Uh, I would like to go to the audience if they have any question. Uh, you can either type the question here or you can unmute yourself and ask any question. Uh, because we do not have many people who so a good setting to ask um, a very engaging question. Uh, I would go first with a one specific question. You talked about uh, the uh, demand distributor and then uh, traffic stream regulator. Mm -hmm. But is there any analysis that you are familiar with like about the effect of safety? Like we know AV will improve the safety, but what will be the safety impact of those which are not automated in a mixed autonomy or like if it's regulate the traffic stream that will obviously affect the safety or improve the safety situation. But how do you, uh, is there any analysis of that uh, for the safety improvement? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think I'm not aware of any any existing work um, investigating the safety implication of this type of control. 
because I think that right now uh, the control are still being developed. Um, and then I think most of the work folks on developing how we actually control the vehicle to effectively um, eliminate, for example, the stop and go um, traffic situations and to, 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 to regulate the traffic stream, to smooth the traffic stream, right? So that's yeah. the, um, the focus now. Um, in our study, when we look at the traffic stream, uh, traffic demand distributor, um, the, the, the hypothesis is you change, a, for example, 20% vehicle, you change the departure time and route choices, and then that their, their change of travel behavior are gonna impact the travel time and then which will indirectly, indirectly influence uncontrolled vehicles, departure time and, and, and new choices, right? So to, and in that case, um, I can imagine the safety benefit is coming from the reduction of the congestions, right? So if you argue if less congested I don't know, maybe it's, it's a, a more congested situation that's a more, uh, it's, it's less safety, less safe. Um, and I can, I can imagine that. Um, so then the safety become a secondary consideration that, in, anyways, in our analysis, it's, it's, we, don't, we didn't consider any safety. Um, yeah. I can only imagine, right, if you think about traffic stream regulator, the whole purpose here, here is to eliminate the stop and go and to smooth the traffic. Right, so in that other outcome, you will improve safety, right? Yes. Um, yeah. But I don't see any um, quantitative analysis on this. Yeah, thank you. So we have got a question in the chat box. Uh, what is your prediction about AV's probable behavior with vulnerable road users? My prediction about, can you elaborate what I mean by the problem? Yeah, behaviors? Raki, we can elaborate the question a little bit more. You give it a little bit more context. Uh, so actually I'm interested to know like, uh, uh, like pedestrian, bicyclist and other stuffs like, uh, so sometimes it seems that uh, pedestrian might um, uh, start jaywalking suddenly or uh, they may come into the OA of like uh, AVIS. Um, so how do we react? Like, will it be able to, in, uh, you know, respect the this users, uh, you know, uh, perfectly or or how how it will ensure their safety? So right, I so there's um, my colleague, quite a few of my colleague at Antre. Um, so their research is really to look at the interaction between AV and pedestrian and bicyclist. So they actually use a lot of instrument um, vehicle and then even instrument bicycle to collect that data and to try to understand the interaction, model interactions. And then um, I guess is also, you have to inform the design of the AV site. Essentially you have to sort of um, design a vehicle in a way that anticipate um, um, the pedestrian and bicyclist behavior and then to, to improve the safety, right? That's also some of the things that we can do um, to sort of, some simple thing you can do is to um, design some of the um, communication method to, to indicate the, the, the intent of the AV and to communicate effectively with pedestrian and, and, and bicyclist, right? Um, so there's some simple idea you can do and maybe in, in the future, um, I think this is a very fascinating topic, it's ongoing research, so definitely. Um, I, I believe maybe in the future, um, AV can have some standard language um, and, and, and to communicate with pedestrian. <laughs> so like, like what we're driving now, we have a turning light and then that's essentially, you indicate your intent, right? So, um, I can imagine uh, maybe that another, unless we have a connectivity, I will become connected, right? If we have um, 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 our human brain or whatever, it's always fully connected with the, the, the world. And then 
so the easy communication channel can be established. Otherwise, if you look at the current situation, then there has to be have has to have some form of communication between the vehicle and pedestrian. So that communication can be some type of lighting or or or, 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 or um, some type of language that both sides can understand. That's what I'm saying. This, this is this is at least the current approach they're trying to propose. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. I have a. I saw the. Um, the yeah, uh, Dr. Radwan. Dr. Radwan has a question. So, Dr. Radwan, if you go ahead and ask the question. Yeah. yeah thank you very much, and uh, very interesting presentation. I, I uh, enjoyed the high level thinking of uh, where we are and where we would be, and I. I felt very comfortable with your comment about we still have a long way to go and the transition period uh, is going to be chaotic at times, to say the least. Uh, but I, I also recall a comment that was made by Elon Musk about how, uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, you find uh, that uh, all the systems that we built over a whole century here are fairly safe and interact with the human brain. And, uh, and all the, the, the challenges that we're facing right now is we're, we're just all of a sudden we want to automate things. We think it's an assembly factory uh, and, and you're an industrial engineer. Now you can relate to a, an assembly line moving at a certain pace. Yeah. Uh, same concept at traffic intersections where, you know, you've got one has the, the go in one direction and the other one comes in. Are we going to revisit the whole infrastructure and change yes. that? And, and would it really take us another century or two to get us there? My God. Yeah, I believe so. I believe that we're going to, um, I definitely agree that if you think about the current design standard, the way we design our infrastructure, right? Yeah. So it's an outcome of the engineering practice of a century. So, so even in the, during the practice, we didn't specifically optimize anything, but that practice gradually improved that this is really a long time of, of, of trial and error approach. Um, so really right now, um, I study the, for example, the, uh, the intersection geometry design. Mm -hmm. So we're really linear optimum for traffic signal control, for example. Even, even engineers do not specifically we want to optimize the layout, but I think that, is, that layout really is well designed. Um, so now, as you said, we design just for the human manually driven vehicle, right? It's a human in a loop. Um, and then, and then right now, if you think about now, you have automated vehicles. Um, I can I can think of the problem will be much more simpler if we look at a fully automated vehicle environment, mm -hmm. right? So I think the challenge is somewhere in between. Yeah. The transition period. But our research, we look at the fully automated vehicle environment. And so in that case, um, the argument we're trying to make is, OK, in the fully automated vehicle environment, um, and you can control the vehicle, you can just specify um, the trajectory of the vehicle. When the vehicle approaches to the intersection, they just tell the vehicle, OK, this is your speed profile follow the speed profile and, and follow this route, you, right. you will, I will ensure the safety pass, safe passage. So our focus was, okay, um, if you have that luxury and if that, that type of environment, how you can better design the intersections, right? Um, so um, because the, the right-of-way allocation, the route can be very complicated. Um, right now you cannot implement it for manually driven vehicle because driver cannot do that thing. They will complicate driver, uh, the confused driver easily. So our research was focusing on that part, um, a fully automated vehicle environment. I think your your question is more about the transition period, mm -hmm. right? So you have a few vehicles that in the traffic stream they're they're fully automated, um, and then there is a there is a vehicle that manually driven, right? So, but if you think about intersection. Um, the current intersection actually, but as lo, at least I'm not so sure about roundabout, this type of design. But if you think about um, signalized intersection, 
I think the rule is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. And because the control device is a traffic light, mm -hmm. and what the um, what the, the automated vehicle can do is just follow the traffic light display and then follow a simple rule. And because the trajectory is given, right, the path is given, and it just follow the leading vehicle and look at the traffic signal. I don't think the for signalized intersection um, and this the having automated vehicle in the traffic stream will create trouble. The same thing can be said for the for the um, 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 freeway merging and diverging. And if you if you implement something. I, I think if you, if you think of a current situation, the merging situation, that's more challenging because you don't have any control at all. Um, and, and people, um, the driver has to do the decide when to merge and how to merge. But if you install something like RAM metering, uh, you have a control device and you allow people to do, um, uh, when allow to, to, you, the system decide when the vehicle can enter the freeway. So in that situation, um, I think it's also easier for a V um, to travel to, in the mixed traffic situation. It's easy for a V to actually um, to do this type of maneuver. Hmm. Okay. So I, I don't know whether I answer a question that, but that, that's. No, I, I think, yeah, it's, it's one of those open ended thing and, and, and that you, you, the points are well taken. Um, the, the, the challenge is if and when we get to the level where we have truly homogeneous uh, uh, flow of traffic. In, in other words, when we get to 100% electric vehicle penetration, and when maybe we decided that Hyperloop would be used only for free transportation underground, mm -hmm. that all the streets and the freeways would be truly like little pods running around vehicles, of, you know, completely controlled. I think we can reach that big dream, but until then, any time we got a mix, not only in the size of the vehicle and the performance of the vehicle, but also a human in the loop, mm -hmm. male, female, old, young, all of that, you know, can override the system. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. We still have a long way to go. Yeah, we um, definitely have a long way to go. That's really why, but that's really why I, 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 I was trying to promoting, um, yeah, even in that situation, there's something we can do, right? Um, for example, I mentioned that you can you can still utilize AV in the traffic stream um, to help you control the traffic, right? So in our community, talk about traffic control, but really the way we control traffic is very limited. Mm -hmm. And we control traffic light and we control for freeway. We don't do, we do ramp metering. Uh, even variable spin limit is, just depends on how, com how, how driver comply, right? So our control instrument really is very limited. Um, so that's why the system is not really controllable. But now with AV in the traffic stream, you actually have additional instrument to allow you to do additional things. That's why I feel that um, that participatory traffic control is, is a very important uh, uh, um, tool, a new tool we have in our toolbox to help improve this traffic situation in that transition period. Um, and also, um, the, for example, AV lane or AV only zone. So those are the things that you don't necessarily implement with 100% market penetration. So as long as the market penetration is high enough, you can do this type of deployment, right? Mm -hmm. So you can still use utilize that to improve system performance and, and to sort of promote and encourage people to adopt AV. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something we can do, but I, I definitely agree there's, a, there's a, gonna be a long transition sure. process and, and chaotic process. Um, but yeah, but I think one day just quick, we don't know, maybe, I don't know, one day just suddenly um, manual human, human driver or manual, manual driving become illegal. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Not in my lifetime, maybe. <laughs> Okay. We have a question from Walter. Walter, if you feel free to ask your question. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yin. 
Uh, I guess right now it's more than one question after hearing the uh, just interaction uh, just now. Uh, so maybe I can follow up one of my comments uh, or, or thinking um, that um, the, like putting the sensors uh, in the AVs uh, individually may sometimes beneficial uh, in the sense that it try to um, just try to replace the driver. So it kind of try to change one factor at one time so that the vehicle can, can kind of uh, re replicate uh, some of the functionalities of human drivers. And then we start to worry about uh, how to improve the infrastructure and how to gradually progress uh, following uh, Dr. Rod uh, Rod1's question, like how to gradually progress uh, to adding more complex uh, components uh, to the picture. Mm -hmm. So I think um, in, the, in that sense, seems in the mixed traffic, ideally we have uh, AV like fully um, like try to sense and try to control uh, will help uh, this transition. So this is just a, a quick comment and um, uh, yeah. And uh, turn to my question. I think uh, my question- I can, uh, actually, I can, if I may, I can respond yeah. to your comment like this. Um, so the point of the vehicle infrastructure cooperation mm -hmm. um, is not to move all the sensor from the vehicle to the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So the idea is the vehicle can be, the vehicle side, they have different level of automation, right? So um, de depends on individual user preference. Um, you don't necessarily purchase level five, for example, uh, car. You can purchase level three. And then when you, a level three vehicle driving on a level A infrastructure, can achieve level five automation. So that's the idea. Um, mm -hmm. So this is a just provide, because, um, because the users are heterogeneous, right? So depending on your willingness to pay, depending on your usage, uh, you will find, I think it's a, it's, so they will, they really, you don't have to purchase, you don't have to always purchase high level automation vehicles. That's the point. So if you think about, from a societal perspective, um, and I imagine that on the market, the, the vehicle had different level of automations, and on the if you on the infrastructure, their digitalization level will be different. Okay, so for a local art hero that you may not have any digitalization, and your parking lot definitely have your your parking garage, the the, the, the driveway do, do not have any instrumentation, but then a heavily utilized um, and freeway corridor will be. Um, equipped, right? So that's the idea of the heterogeneity um, in terms of infrastructure um, digitalization and, 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 and vehicle automations. Yep. Um, but certainly, if you talk about, um, about the deployment, right? So um, whether this is um, the current approach, definitely, I call this the, a bottom up approach, which is um, you make the AV to be so this have been this model because that's the reason why a lot of company invest on put all the sensor on the vehicle side, um, because this is easy to deploy, right? And the customer buying, and then they do not rely on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is the way, that's why, why the re this is the major reason why the concept of hi automated highway system die because there's no business model. And there's a chicken egg problem, okay? Um, and then right now, if you put all the sensor on the infrastructure, on the, on the driver side, on the vehicle side, then you do have that business model and then to rely on the purchase, the willingness to pay of the customers. Um, but I just feel that from the societal perspective, we need to do this type of vehicle infrastructure corporations. And certainly it's, it's gonna require policy to encourage these two operators to collaborate. Okay, it won't, uh, in some of the situation is won't naturally happen. Right. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, so go back to the question uh, I originally have. Uh, so it's related to equity. So uh, when you talk about uh, many great ideas and very innovative ideas, uh, typically the assumption is um, uh, vehicles seems to be under control in some way. So they are able to be dispatched either the speed or the routes. Um, so I, I just wondering what's your vision about the ownership uh, of those vehicles? 
are they going to still be private owned? Uh, if that's the case, um, I mean, incentive is one of them to try to make people cooperate. But from my personal uh, kind of thinking, I feel like uh, if I own this vehicle and this vehicle is allowed to be controlled by someone, it seems need some other like models uh, to make it work. So I just wondering, is, do you have any uh, comments on this? And related to this is about equity. So who benefits? If you invest a lot of money uh, in infrastructure um, and only those people able to benefit, that they may not be acceptable, right? So probably uh, from an equity perspective, uh, I'm wondering, do you have uh, any further uh, comments? Uh, yeah, about I think that's two great questions. Um, yeah, the, for, the, for the first question, I personally believe that the private ownership will not go away um, in the fully automated vehicle environment. Um, and I believe that some people still want to own a car. That's the reason why I said the utilization of the AV will be different, very from people to people. Um, and some of the AV will be heavily utilized because they're owned by, by uh, some, uh, some operators' um, platforms and other will be privately owned and most of the time they're gonna be parked. Um, and, and certainly, um, in, in the, for the idea of um, the particip participatory traffic control, um, and we assume that the AV can be controlled, then with that assumption you do, you, you just look at the, the, the method, right? Control, what type of control you do um, mm -hmm. in order to serve the purpose. But you're right, um, and whether the, the, the owner of the vehicle want to be controlled or not is a different question. Um, really, that's the reason why I, I sort of talk about the, um, the in, uh, incentive, right? So the, why we have to use mechanism design um, to solve that issue. So, so you, you can, you have to do, you have to provide some incentives um, and, and, and uh, like I, I mentioned, you can use some auctioning mechanism that uh, if you don't want to be controlled, so be it, you, you don't have to be controlled. Um, but I believe that from the system perspective, if you can estimate what's the benefit of controlling this particular vehicle, depending on the position of the vehicle, for example, the benefit gonna be translated into $100, and then my total highest payment can be $100, right? So I can use some auction mechanism to, uh, to incentivize this guy. If this guy does not accept, I move to the next guy. So I can imagine some of this type of mechanism can, can help solve the problem. Um, that's my, my current thinking. Um, so um, what's the second question? Equity. So, oh, the um, equity, yeah. The yeah. equity, I think that's also a good question. So that's the reason why, for example, when we talk about subsidy, uh, I mentioned that you have to um, estimate the distributional effect of the policy, right? And when you design the policy, really um, you look at that distributional effect. That's the reason why um, that's how you estimate the impacts on different groups of people. Um, and that's how you capture the equity considerations. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. For the... yeah. yeah, but whenever you do something to change the demand side or supply side, you always change the status quo, right? When you change the status quo, you definitely create, you definitely redistribute the benefit. Yeah, I agree. Right? When you redistribute the benefit, then that you're gonna create some, some equity issues because really um, depending, if your benchmark is the status quo, then if you do something, redistribute the, the benefit, then you can create, you, you can create some, some inequality concerns unless you do Pareto improving, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess the, the, the question, sorry, uh, I'm not sure whether I still have time, uh, but if I do, uh, so, so the, the, the reason I ask this question is sometimes it's very difficult to quantify those benefits. So for example, uh, if you want to quantify the benefits, sometimes you need the real time, like uh, information about the translation system. Uh, if you want to target to individual uh, or give uh, compensation to individual, that seems, uh, 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 I mean, uh, from, from my standpoint, it seems still very challenging to do in translation system, um, but I, I, I'm hopeful, right? In the future, we can able to quantify those benefits and 
do this redistribution. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I agree. Um, it's always difficult um, to to do this type of to estimate the distribution impact, the distribution effect of the a particular policy, um, and then that does require a lot of data um, to, to to estimate that effect accurately. Right. Thanks. We have one question in the chat box about the sensing between infrastructure and vehicle. I think the question is about uh, the yes, the company wise, like who has uh, if we have a standard standard? common standard, yeah, <laughs> for communicating different uh, companies of vehicles. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I we. Um, I think that right, this is a new research, right? This is, this is a new direction. Um, um, I personally believe that in the future, um, the, yeah. uh, when we enable driving automation, I, 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 the vehicle infrastructure cooperation makes sense, right? Um, and then definitely you need a standard that um, how those vehicle interact with, with the infrastructure, right? So the vehicle produced by different company um, and, and even for the, for the roadside unit, for the, for the smart sensor nodes. Um, and there's also have a standard uh, issue there, over there. Um, yeah, I, I, I do believe that um, eventually the industry will see the need of developing such a standard um, and to facilitate the deployment of this type of system. Great. Any, any other question? Does anyone have any question? I, I can ask you a very um, general question because you have done so much research on AVs. Uh, a few, few days ago, I attended a semi um, PhD uh, dissertation uh, of his computer science student, and he was modeling the cooperation between vehicle and uh, human-driven vehicles and automated vehicles. And he was modeling uh, sympathy in the autonomous vehicles. He was trying to incorporate sympathy in autonomous vehicle. Now, one of the question, so when I asked him that, how did you model the human driver behaviors? So he was trying to say he, he used IDM to model the behavior of uh, human-driven vehicles. So, that comes to the question about are we had we really have that the kind of models that we have for car following model for human driven vehicles and also the AV vehicles. Do we have the correct model that can create that kind of mental scenario between uh, the interaction between because the kind of model that we have at, for the purpose of designing infrastructure for understanding like how we should design the infrastructure, but not really about the mental um, uh, model of uh, human drivers as well as the, uh, how it will interact with the AVs. Um, so I just wanted to see what's, what are your thoughts about the limitations of our uh, uh, models or simulation models to uh, simulate AV research uh, or human interaction between uh, AVs and human-driven vehicles. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, it's actually relevant to my comment on the bully behavior, yes. right? Yeah. So, um, Right now, we do, I mean, for all the car following behaviors, um, we actually use empirical data to calibrate them. And then that's how we model the driver be behaviors, right? So at this moment, we don't have any data um, that, I mean, you don't have a deployment, you have very limited deployment. Um, and I don't think that we have sufficient data to look at how human drivers interact with AV, right? And there's some yeah. research that's done in, in, in lab environment um, that like the paper I just mentioned um, to look at that type of bully behaviors. Um, so I, I, I think this is a very interesting um, topic really. Uh, when, you, when you have really a, a su sufficient number of vehicles deployed in the traffic stream, um, and then because those vehicles actually had the sensor, right? Um, and they can actually observe this the, the behavior of the vehicle surrounding this vehicle. Um, so that data actually is available and we can definitely look at how those, those human driver interact with the AV. Um, yeah, I think this is an interesting topic. 
thank you. Uh, is there any one we have time for one or two questions? If there is any question from the audience, we can go with that. I think I don't see uh, any questions. Yeah. If no one has uh, any more questions, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think uh, anyone this, has any questions. So you can uh, go for the last question. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned, just curious about the, the MCD. Um, in, in Michigan, you mentioned you already interact with some autonomous vehicles in, on campus uh, at yeah. Michigan. So I'm wondering what's the current situation, like uh, how the deployment of CAV uh, over there, is there any opening? It's not, it's, yeah, okay. It's not, um, used to be MCD doing experiments uh, on campus. So we have automated, automated bus, a shuttle okay. running a fixed route. Um, and in North Campus, just like a few minutes from me, and there's a fixed route. Um, they're doing that experiments. So very often, I when I drive, I come across that that automated shuttle. But then recently, there's a company I forgot the name. Uh, is not a is not a company affiliated with university. It's not. It's, it's I think it's um, I forgot the name. There's a company based in Ann Arbor, and then they're doing a lot of experiments. Um, um, in Ann Arbor. So when you drive, very often you see that AV and they're driving on campus, they're driving um, across um, the city. Um, and, and, and yeah, I often come across them. So, so, so that's a, a five, a level five, like fully automated or it just, I mean, have a human inside, but. Uh, yeah, the, uh, I would, the, the law required to have a human operator. Yeah. Supervisor over there, so it's hard for me to um, to see what it is. I, I believe it's level four. Okay. Yes, yeah, at least it's level four. Um, yeah, and the, and the automated shadow we have um, that's is level five. Yeah, that's is level five um, automated shadow, but now they actually stopped that. Uh, the experiment's finished, and they have all the data. We have a company in Florida, in Orlando, it's named Beep. So they, they test an autonom automated shuttle in Lake Nona City. So they have automated shuttle going there. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And we have a autonom two autonomous shuttle in our campus. And it's going to be uh, starting soon uh, by, from an FHW project. All right, I don't think any other questions. So thank you, Professor. Ian for giving us uh, such a nice talk. And I, I think we had a very engaged discussion after the talk. So I believe um, everyone has benefited from the talk. So we are very happy to listen to your talk. So keep us, uh, keep us in touch. Yep, thank you very much. Thank you for having thank me. You. Yep, take thank care. you all. Yep, thank you bye all bye. for attending this seminar. Thanks, bye. Thank you so much. Bye, Jamio. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you.